So I just wanted to have a conversation with a guy that's been jamming with the band for a little while now, that's been playing with the Six Chamber. If you guys have been following the channel or following the band, you probably know that we got a new single out that just came out. It's called Walpurgis Night. We've been getting some good feedback on that. People have been saying it's basically like Bram Stoker's Dracula put to music, you know, so I can't complain about that. I like that description. Um, but anyway, we've been playing with a guy who's got a long and storied past in, in rock history. He's played on numerous hit albums, numerous hit songs. I think he has something like 14 platinum albums through his work through the decades. And it's stuff that, you know, I grew up on, some of you guys probably grew up on. In fact, you basically can't walk into, you can't walk into somewhere in public that plays classic rock or rock and roll, or you can't listen to the radio without hearing this fucking guy. He's toured with Alice Cooper, with Billy Squire. He's an original member of Billy Squire on all the hits all throughout the years. Um, with Iggy Pop, John N. Twistle, Twisted Sister, and actually, like, guys, I just had to fucking, I had to pick my favorite stuff. Because if, if, if we went through all of it, we'd be sitting here all fucking day. <laughs> so I just picked, like, the, a couple of the groups that I, I liked, or maybe you guys might like. Um, you know, with Alice Cooper, that was one of the first bands in hard rock and metal that used the gothic imagery. I'm a major fan. I grew up on that stuff. Um, probably some of you guys did. I like to think or hope to think that maybe some of those fans might like some of our stuff. Also, uh, I've been wanting to have a conversation about this stuff, you know, with Alan for a long time. And uh, actually, we have talked about it um, quite a bit, you know, on the way to gigs and things like that. But I thought that instead of just doing this one-on-one, -on -one, why don't we have this discussion and maybe some of you guys that are interested in rock history, you know, might dig it as well. So, uh, how did I meet this guy? Okay, I got a friend that I went to high school with who wound up playing in Puddle of Mud. He played bass in Puddle of Mud for a few years. Alan had met those guys, that circle. So when I was looking for a keyboardist, I called up uh, Mike Anthony, is his name. I called up and I said, hey, do you know any guys that play keyboards? And he said, as a matter of fact, I do. And at that moment, I blinked and poof, a puff of smoke appeared. And then as the smoke dissipated, this fucking guy was sitting there, Mr. Alan St. John. So, Alan, it's good to see you, man. Me I'm too. glad we're, we're getting to do this. Me too. I don't know what kind of smoke it was, but <laughs> I, can, I can tell you. The one album I wanted to um, talk to you about a bit, again, because I'm such a big fan of Alice Cooper, I think, you know, between, um, you know, the gothic horror elements of him and the stuff that we do, there's a, a somewhat of a link there mm -hmm. that people could appreciate. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, so you recorded on Alice Cooper Trash, mm -hmm. um, which was, I believe, his either his biggest album of his career, or at least the single Poison was the biggest selling it, single it, of his career. It was, um, yeah. I, I would say, you know, we consider as rock fans, most of us, the classic Alice Cooper would be the early 70s, you know, killer. Sure. Welcome to My Nightmare, Love It to Death, mm -hmm. uh, Billion Dollar Babies, sure. all that stuff um, as rock fans. But the biggest uh, song Alice Cooper ever had, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is Poison. Poison. And you were on that song yeah. and yeah. on that album. So what was that whole experience like? How did it come about? What was the studio atmosphere? Just um, anything you can tell us about that. I, uh, that album was produced by Desmond Child, mm -hmm. who co-wrote it with Alice. Um, I believe John Okari wrote one of the songs, which was great, who was a guitar player with Cindy Lauper, who was a dear friend of ours for years before that. Mm -hmm. um, but Desmond was using our musicians, me, Bobby, Chenard. Oh, really? From yeah. Squire? Yeah. <clears throat> Pretty much using all, of, all that, uh, all the players, with the exception of the bass player. Um, okay. Hugh McDonald, who's uh, uh, actually playing with Bon Jovi more than often now, uh -huh. um, who did most of Bon Jovi's records, unbeknownst to the bass uh -huh. player. So, oh, uh, oh, that's yeah, that's yeah, all. Yeah. That's going to be a scary story. I forget if I heard that one from you mm -hmm. or the thing going around the yeah. internet. So yeah, and um, and we just use different 
uh, guitar players on that record, on the trash record. And yeah, I, because I worked with Desmond before that um, on other projects, he, they wanted to use that band. Ted Nugent wanted to use that band. Like Alice, um, Alice, you know, he's been through a lot of members ever since the original band broke up. I mean, more lately, he's had the same people in for years and years. Yeah. But at those time, th that era, he was using uh, different people. Yeah. So he just he just saw what he liked with Squire well, or whatever, and he said, "Let's use these people." Yeah. I mean, and also Alice, you know, at that point there was Diane Warren writing a lot of stuff with Desmond for a lot of artists that were hits, like Beyond Belief hits, Michael Bolton. Iggy Pop, yeah. Cher, Bon Jovi, name it. You know, he was the shit at that time, you know? And what studio did you record that in, do you remember? We we did basic tracks at the Power Station in New York and then finished the, the uh, all the overdubs up at Woodstock oh. in Bearsville. And, um... <laughs> <laughs> so did you? Um, so if all the the guys with the drummer and the guys with, uh, from Squire were on it, did you guys rehearse quite a bit with Alice, or was it kind of a studio creation where you made with Desmond no. Child in the studio, or we, how did that how did the process go? It was a combination of both. It was okay. a combination of both. Yeah, um, obviously because if you're going into the studio to record at two hundred dollars a fucking hour, exactly, you want to rehearse, <laughs> exactly. you know, and yeah. you know, and, and Woodstock was a place that I hadn't recorded recorded at at that point ever and it was kind of cool to me and that was the big analog studio era yeah. era with the two inch tape oh and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah you know yeah. uh the mm -hmm. real deal you had to be able to actually play it you know yeah. you, you, you could edit back then but it was literally like with a fucking razor blade on the tape right yeah like, okay yeah, which always yeah. made me nervous as hell, man. <laughs> i can't yeah i can't even i, I can't it. figure out still to this day how they listened for that place to cut and it's always like my heart was in my throat but the, uh, I've had I've been very fortunate enough to work with the best producers that were around and engineers and still try and keep it like that and learn so much from these guys you know and so uh, oh yeah th that's what I was going to ask you so it seemed like a lot of the projects that you did or for a certain period had to do with uh, Desmond Child and in case, you know, you guys probably know who he is, but in case it's just any people that are just into underground music or don't know the names or whatever the case is, he's one of the biggest songwriters, producers in the world. I think his first break was with Kiss, you know, I Was Made For Loving You. Yeah, and then yeah. he's has hits, he's still to this day, like a lot of the songs that you hear as hits, not as many rock songs he anymore. He also just got done doing Aerosmith for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, just... Count, uh, countless. Um, so how did you, uh, were you kind of like his go-to guy for a while, or how did all these things yeah. come up with, with, with him, working with him? And how was that experience? Like, like what what made him you special want, as a producer? Let's, you know, just... All right, now, let me ask you first, answer your first question. How did it come up? Yeah. My best buddy, Bobby, called me in for the session. Okay. And I went into the studio and was playing down some of my ideas that he wanted to wanted to hear and he sorry Desmond I got it you're already out it anyway so fuck it he liked my hands <laughs> okay goes, so I said really whatever well, gets you the gig you know like <laughs> but um no it, it musically it just worked out perfectly at that time and, and, you know, yeah it, 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 it had nothing to do with anything else it was yeah. just what we could contribute to his projects that he wanted, and he was a smart producer, great musician. Um, his his very first group was called Desmond Child and Rouge. Right, right. And when we did these sessions out of New York, right, out of New York, yeah, we he would have Rouge come in with me and another singer, male singer, uh, to do all the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it just so you knew him for a while. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And yeah. he knew that you guys were a solid group. It was just a reliability yeah. thing. It and, was a solid you know. group of sound. Yeah, of what it was. You know, when Nugent called us, it was for our sound. So you became like the behind-the-scenes studio guys for Desmond Child, kind of. It was easy. Yeah. He could mm -hmm. call you up. You could get down yeah. there, and he know you would nail Especially it. Especially in New York. York. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then you know, we we we'd go out. In no time, I mean, it, with our recording, the the quickest part of it, 
was recording Alan. It was just come in, boom, it's done. I think he did a second take maybe once or twice. You know? Probably. So that's, <laughs> Probably. I guess that's what it takes to be called up, you know, in, as a studio guy. And then, you know, and, and then vocal backgrounds, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. where it was Louis, uh, another, the only other dude that was with me on vocal sessions for most of, his, uh, of uh, Desmond's stuff was a, a, a man uh, named Louis Merlino. Uh, who had a band? That sounds familiar. Yeah, who has had a band called Beggars and Thieves, which I played on their album. Okay. Um, great voice, great voice. Um, so it was him and I, and two, two or three other women so, at sometimes, and that that was Rouge. Um, okay. So, and uh, so, so you were going to after that album? Um, that was a, an enormous uh, success and smash hit. Um, you were gonna. You you told me I think when we talked that you were gonna go out uh, and continue on tour with Alice, but what happened is there was a conflict, be, a scheduling conflict between Billy Squire tour and Alice mm -hmm. Cooper tour. Yeah. So you basically, I don't know, out of loyalty or out of choice or preference or whatever it was, you went with Squire's tour. Yeah, because and I had been at that point in time. <laughs> I had been with him for so many years. That's who you arrived with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, the only other tour that I turned down like, was a foreigner tour. Um, I mean, on one hand, just before you get into that, it's like, you know, there's a friend element and a loyalty element mm -hmm. and, you know, so it's like, that's cool and honorable that you did. But unfortunately, how fate turned out, Billy stopped playing, what, three years later, whereas Alice is like still, still playing, you know, just, I mean, still. Yeah, you know what? So who knows, you know, you, you, you do don't you have any regrets that. about it or you just. I don't have any regrets at all because first of all, when Foreigner asked me to go out with them. Billy had a relationship with someone that was in Farner. Yeah. And they wanted to, meet, to steal me away from Billy. So, and they offered me a lot of money. I took it. And then Billy offered me a lot more money. And I'm just being honest as fuck right now. Okay? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I did both. So <laughs> it's like, I'm okay with that, you know? Yeah, um, and we also <coughs> shared the same manager. You did, not me. That was another thing I was going to bring up when I said before that we had kind of a few things that uh, in common throughout our lives at different times, unrelated circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, we both worked with this kind of old school, um, you know, gritty uh, rock and roll manager, tough persona, you know. Dangle on, you know, dangle them out the window by their ankles, kind of a old school guy, yeah. uh, no bullshit guy named Bud Prager, and he was um, revered. I mean, he was either feared or revered or whatever, you know. But he people was respected him. He, he was, was yeah. Uh, like I, yeah, exactly. When I started working with him, and I mentioned his name to people, they're like, oh, oh my god, you know. Mm -hmm. But he, he was the manager. First of all, he worked with Cream on that album. He didn't manage them, but he worked with them. And uh, he then managed Mountain, Mississippi Queen. Uh, he managed Foreigner. He managed Megadeth. Typo Negative, him and his partner managed them. I believe Bad Company, White Snake. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, with him, I learned a lot from him. He was, he, he, he was a mentor. He taught me a lot about songwriting. For some reason, he had decided to work with the Six Chamber. We were like, why the fuck does this guy want to work with us? And I'm like, I don't know, but let's not fuck it up. You know, but anyway, we didn't fuck it up. What wound up happening is he wound up, he passed away while he was working with us. He got diagnosed with cancer. What are you laughing about? <laughs> no, it's, it was fucking that heart, shit, It yeah. was heartbreaking. Yeah, it, of course it was heartbreaking. It was. But that's no, your luck. That's my that's luck. That's my too. luck. You're laughing at our luck. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're yeah, not laughing. Just, at just, no, I'm laughing okay. at fate. Yeah, no, I, you know, that, that's that. as bad as it gets. Yeah. You know, like it, it's as bad as as horrible as it gets. Yes. And uh, it was heartbreaking scenario, you know, but I did have good experiences. I, I, I learned from it. I learned a lot about um, songwriting. I learned about a lot about the industry. Um, a lot. I heard a lot of stories about, you know, Leslie West and uh, Dave Mustaine and and all these people. When he, when Bud died, um, Dave Mustaine actually eulogized him on his website. He said. Bud taught me not to sniffle. <laughs> so that's like, that gives you an idea of the kind of guy he was. It's just, you know, he, he wanted to uh, toughen you up. For us, he was a fierce critic. We would bring him stuff. We would write stuff. He would laugh, you know, and not laugh, but he would just look at us and be like, 
could you imagine you guys up there on stage, you know, playing this? You know, this, he was a tough. And you had to, and you could either, you could either get all heard about it and be like, oh, blah, 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 it's so great. Or you could sit there and think about it. And it's Shut like, it you know up. what? He's, he's fucking right. And so you had, to be, you had to write something that you believed in. And you could, and, and if you said this is crap, you could defend yourself. But, do, you know, but you had to really be honest whether, you know, the, the quality of it. And he, he would push you. I describe it almost like that movie, The Karate Kid, where the, Mr. Miyagi's making the guy paint the house. That was like working, working with Bud, okay? And the point was he was trying to get us. So he said, if you can get through me over my hurdle, you can get through anybody, mm -hmm. you know, as far as, because he know, knows how it is with uh, musicians that are first out there. People want to tear them. Uh, to shreds, but um, so that was a that was a great experience. Unfortunately, it ended, you know, sadly when he passed away. But it turns out that Alan was also uh, managed by Bud and worked with Bud. Uh, was it with Foreigner and Leslie West, or just with Foreigner? It was or? Foreigner and Tommy Shaw from or Tommy Shaw. That's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I, I have worked with Leslie before, but not through not not through wasn't Bud. through Bud. It was after that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll never forget my first meeting with Bud up in his office. He's sitting behind his big wooden desk, and he yeah. said, looking at me, and I said, so I said, so what's up? He goes, you look like trouble to me. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a challenge. You'd sit there. He'd be behind this desk, always behind this yeah. desk. I don't have any other vision of him other than behind that desk, other than when he came to see us play at the Key Club. Uh, and he would just stare you down. You know, he wouldn't talk fast. It would be a slow thing. And then he would just deliver some line like that, you know, and yeah, see no, how he, you reacted. Yeah, and he did. <laughs> I said, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Another big thing was he, he I don't want to say he hated jazz. It wasn't about a hatred of jazz, but he, he was very against uh, jazziness in mm -hmm. rock music. He mm -hmm. believed in, as he called, crisp riffs, hard, hard rock, crisp riffs. And good lyrics, and mm -hmm. and he every time a band would stray, oh, this guitar solo, this da da da, he would try to steer them back towards the core of songwriting. He said he would get, you know, people would sit down and play him a demo, and he would shut it off after 15 seconds, and then go, but 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 you need to hear the guitar solo, and you go, I won't listen to the guitar solo, because he needed to hear it, the quality in the songwriting, like mm -hmm. we're talking about, crisp riffs. Hard riffs, good riffs, and good, well thought out lyrics. Whether no matter what it was about, it wasn't like, oh, he's trying to make you write about this or that. It was just he needed to hear those fundamental things, you know. Yeah, like so. he, like Mick Jones, delivered. Right, right. You know, I mean, even Mick Jones, he was so proud of Foreigner. Like I know he was very proud of Foreigner, but he said to me one time, he's like. Nobody, you know, has a hard rock core like me other than Leslie West. And he's like, I, I told that to Felix I, Papillardi, and I told that to Mick Jones. I said, you're a softy, you know, and Leslie West is... Yeah, guess know. what? <laughs> guess what? You can be as soft as you want. You keep writing those shit and yeah. songs like but, Mick Jones. But yeah, that, that was his cash cow for oh, all those guys. Oh, God, you kidding me? I mean, I mean still that's when insane. I went out with them, before, you know, on the Agent Provocateur tour. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, and the only reason I had to leave there was one of two. Like I said, I got another a better offer. Yeah. Because there was a battle between yeah the, Nick and Billy. Yeah. But the other reason was that the, that tour was not making money, and there was a huge there was a three backline uh, uh, lineup. The Foreigner tour wasn't making money. Yeah, was in it, the eighties. It was uh yeah, it had to be late eighties. It was a. a tour to support the Agent Provocateur album. Okay. So, so they had to cut costs. And I was the newcomer. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sitting in, in a hotel room with, with Nick, Lou, and, and Bud, and, and they apologized. They took care of me like you wouldn't believe. I said, look, we just got to cut costs. And, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's fine. That's cool. I understood the business at that time. Yep. Yeah, I understood. And I also had another gig to go to. Exactly. You didn't seem like hurting, hurting for work at that time. No. And another thing with us, like, through our conversations, over the over um, the months is there's kind of like I don't know whether to call it a synchronicity or just certain things in our life that or certain situations or places that we've been totally unrelated you know different time periods different scenarios uh, but that you know we've both um, been through and the one thing is that I grew up uh, I cut my teeth like in Greenwich Village in that music scene going to see shows it was a pretty wild place back then it wasn't really you know um ge quite gentrified yet you know it was a different world it still had that you know wildness from back in the day 
I, that's where I grew up as a teenager. I would get out there and see shows, see concerts. Uh, any weekend I could, anybody, anyone I could find to drive me out there, I would do it. I wound up playing, uh, I got a gig playing bass with um, the old Misfits guitarist and his band The Undead. We played CBGBs, all those clubs. Now, Alan actually grew up in, in Greenwich Village, like literally grew up. That's where he was born and raised. And, and from what I understand, got in the music scene there pretty young. Greenwich Village is my holy ground and will always be. I mean, it was loaded with poets, musicians, artists, and I just relished it. You know? And so when I had a chance to still stay down there, um, I, I jumped at it and found out how to play all these clubs down there and with you know, hundreds of different artists who also got their starts at a place called The Bitter End. Which, yeah. um, uh, which is on Bleecker Street down in Greenwich. Is it still? Uh, it's active? still there. Yeah. Yes, okay. um, but I'm still waiting to uh, finish up the documentary about the bitter end. And when did that club start? Like what period of time? 1959. Wow! So I'm it's almost like the Troubadour here. Yeah, that, that you know. Kind of thing. And you know, I got to be really good friends with uh, uh, the owner, whose name is Paul Colby, who passed. A little while ago, and I was fortunate enough to have the ability to film a documentary on a club for its 50th anniversary. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm well aware of that place. I remember it. And uh, was that the, like one of the places that Hendrix and them would play? And all? Ca Hendrix played Cafe Wa. Okay. Uh, Hendrix did not go and play the Better End, but he frequented it a lot. Okay. Um, Do you notice a big difference? now than back in the day, you know, as far as the arts and the, the, the scene and everything like that? Yeah, I absolutely do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think we had this discussion a couple of times, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's nowhere near what it like it used to be. Um, right now, in my mind, my opinion, it's all about the money. That's all I can tell you. All I can do is write the music. And you know, the rest of us, we play music, we write music, we do music. You, you two, speak music that's your first language you know what i mean you're probably better at music than you are at uh, speaking any, english any, anything else <laughs> you know what, anything else you know what i mean it's pretty amazing you know so it's it's an honor to play with you know musicians of your caliber no. uh, your project um spoke to me uh and i've done pro uh, one project other than this that was in a similar uh, style Mm -hmm. And that was with uh, D. Snyder, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, who's a dear family friend, uh, godfathers to his kids. So, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm akin to that style, but I didn't have that many opportunities to play that style of music and enter that and understand it. But because mo I think most of the time it was just for show. But with your project, with the Sixth Chamber, I felt your total sincerity to the to the project and all the homework you've done, you know, understanding the message that your music wanted to send, I think. Um, and that was the most interesting thing to me, other than, you know, aside from the fact that the music is cool, you know? When do you get to play a pipe organ sound, <laughs> you know? Come on. Yeah, 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 exactly. And have it appreciated. And you fucking nailed it, too, yeah. And the, So you were from New York, but how did you wind up hooking up with Billy Squire's group uh, out of Boston? How did that come about? I was rehearsing in New York, in one of New York's studios that I was living in my apartment, maybe like 100 yards from, with other bands. And um, Billy was auditioning keyboard players, and I happened to be in the studio there at the same time and the drummer Bobby Chenard who was my best friend in the world who's gone right now um, walked past me in the hall and said hey do you play keyboards and I said yeah he goes do you sing I said yeah she goes get your ass in here went in there played two and a half songs and got the gig and I think it was for about Billy brought me out outside the studio 
and asked me if I really wanted the gig. I said, yeah, shit, yeah, yeah let's go. And, uh, and, and so he know. didn't know who you were, but he just heard, he, you went in and jammed and he heard it, and it's like, oh, that's yeah. kind of like how yeah, it was with just, us, too, but yeah. <laughs> probably like everybody. He stopped did. in the middle of the, the, the second song and said, do you want the gig? And I said, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. No, they hadn't had their first hit yet or anything like that? They or? had, that was the tour for the Tale of the Tape tour. Um, 78, I believe it was, and, um, the, the, I think the big hit on that album was The Big Beat, it was called. So they wanted to, you know, to do a video for that and have, and continue on a tour. And, um, that's how it started. And I said, yeah, okay. And it didn't stop from then on. I did every album and every tour from 78 through 2010, I think. Okay. You know. And so when the when it when it really started to break when you guys did I guess Lonely is the Night, The Stroke, In the Dark, yeah. all that stuff. Um I know you had done you had actually done some notable stuff before that, right? But like but that was really the big time. That was like I don't know what position it was on the chart if it was the <laughs> number one. It, 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 it sold like, seven it million was, it sold that album sold seven million. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was a don't say no album. And so, what was that like to you? Did you feel like that was just something that was always destined to happen to you, or did you feel did it change your view on music in any way, or what was your feeling? What, what was that feeling like when you guys hit the top? First of all, my feeling was being able to pay the rent on time. <laughs> always a good feeling. <laughs> Second of all, I love the music, and because of the fact that it reminded me of a Led Zeppelin. All right, okay. which was yeah, um, one of my favorites and still is, still is, um, and I just the band was killer, you know, the players were killer. And what was the um, the touring? I mean, music. The music world is so different in so many ways now. You know, like what was the the touring um, life like? What was the touring experience like? I mean, you guys were playing fucking arenas. Like, you, you know, nowadays the stuff. You know, that's that was what was on top of the charts at that time. Nowadays, like, what's on the charts, I don't even know what's on the charts. All I can tell you is it's not rock, mm -hmm. and so I'm not really interested. But yeah. but this was a t one of the time periods, you know, through history when rock was number one, I would say. Yeah, you know, yeah through the late and 70s, through the 80s, into the early 90s, mid-90s. It was still heavy duty. I mean, then in the 90s, you had grunge rock out of Seattle, <coughs> uh, uh, Seattle yeah. which I love still. I mean, yeah. I love Dave Grohl. He's a fucking yeah. one of my favorite. Very cool. I'm a big like. Alice in Chains fan. Yeah, and I'm a big jealous fan of, of him. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but it, it was it was different back there, back then, to, to, to not... You didn't have to, let's put it this way, you didn't have to worry about your airplay because it was still airplay. Yeah. So that was, you know, we, we broke MTV, you know. We, we were one of the first peoples who come out there. Uh, you know, uh, after that, everything that happened after that was just cake. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and as long as we kept on putting out good songs and good music, Billy didn't give a shit. You know, he, you know, we, we got... I'm not going to say we got lucky, but he worked his ass off for all that. You know, and so did yep. we all. Yep, yep. Mind you, we had a lot of fun working our asses off. But, you know, the man was one of the only artists that I, one of the few artists that I know that worked as hard as he did. He was a perfectionist, you know. And the audience realized that. And the audience also realized the song qualities. Yeah. You yeah. know, they would, you know, yeah, we did stadiums, we did all arenas we sold out all of them we set records in, in the states in new york blah 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 but we he paid his dues we paid our dues you know opening up for certain acts you know especially acts like queen foreign people like that you know which helped him gain his respect def leppard opened up for us you know um, it, it was just at that time in, in at that point in time we were able to do that, yeah, because it, there was a venue for that. There was, you know, there was, there was a platform, and it was about quality uh, songwriting because yeah. a lot was on the line if you didn't come through with with quality songs. And we're talking about good lyrics and uh, solid riffs, 
yeah. you know, um, a lot of the groups, there's amazing groups nowadays uh, through and through, but I, I see with a lot of groups, though, they have, they'll have amazing riffs, but they don't care about the lyrics. It's mm -hmm. just like it's something they throw on top, or somebody has a great lyric, but it's just, you yeah. know, what's it's going on. It's funny you said that, you know, the lyrics, because in my mind, lyrically, Billy was one of the best lyricists, most intelligent lyricists. Mm -hmm. We're still keeping the rock edge that people can relate to. Yeah. You know, at, at the age group that we were heading for. Or, yeah. Or whatever. And they still remember it. I still get texts and all these messages that, you know, these songs have changed their lives, blah, 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 which is such a great feeling. And it, I can't even tell you how good that feels. It, it actually almost feels better than the applause that you hear doing a fucking stadium. <clears throat> You yeah, know what I'm yeah, yeah. But not. We did a lot of stadiums and arenas, you know, where people like The Who, you know, the, the foreigner. Yeah, yeah. I got to ask you, as far as the touring life, like, was it like Spinal Tap? Is it, is it like the movies? Is it like the joke? Is it like the parody? I know you told, you told me some stories like... I'm gonna get this wrong, but you and you and Billy like were driving around Mexico and drove like to the wrong fucking stadium to play or something like that. I know it's a, probably got it wrong. Uh, no, but no, 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 no. Billy wasn't there, thank God. <laughs> it, we, we we were in uh, God, what town was it? Uh, El Paso. Okay. okay. And we were at a, oh, across the uh, the Rio Grande from uh, I guess Tijuana. Yeah. And um, we took the tour bus myself. My best friend, the drummer. Bobby. That would be Juarez, actually. Juarez, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, the tour. One of the uh, one of our tour bus drivers had a birthday. Yeah. So we said, let's. You know, we had a show that night, and it was like nine o'clock in the morning. I think it's like, and we took the tour bus down to Juarez. Me, my best friend Bobby, the drummer, just to check it out. Basically. Just to check it out. Yeah, yeah. Just to have. A, have a drink or two. See what it was about. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so you got this big tour bus driving down fucking the streets of fucking Mexico, parked outside. We have a gig that night in El Paso. <laughs> the three of us stayed there and we were drinking, obviously drinking some nice tequila, stalagmite, stalagmites, or yeah, stalactites hanging from the wall and the ceiling disappeared big and chihuahuas running around our feet <laughs> and um, the copious amounts of everything else. So we had a sound check I think at about, you know, usually it was around five. We had to be back at the, at, at the venue at five. So we get back out and um, got out of the tour bus and it wound up being, we walk into a totally dirt covered floor for a radio, uh, rodeo. <laughs> and we said, we're in the wrong spot, dude. Man. We're in the wrong spot. Let's get out of here. So went back, finally found the right venue. Did we're, you get there on time? Or? No. We were, <laughs> the sound check, blah, 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 blah. Went back to the hotel. And now our show doesn't start until like 10. Okay. But it wasn't like the crowd was waiting for you, like sitting out there. Because mm -hmm. I've been, I've been, I saw Guns N' Roses in Argentina and Axel Rose showed up like two hours late, and the crowd was literally there just watching a blank stage. I'll for... tell you a story about that, too. <laughs> so back to uh, Texas. Yeah. So we were in, in Texas, and Bobby and I are in my hotel room, as usual. Yeah. yeah. Um, after going up to the bar and having a few drinks, and Bobby was known to have antenna to see who was... So that was like your, your partner in crime in the oh, band, uh, the drummer? Absolutely. Uh, you guys were yeah, yeah, yeah. got on good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So he had his antenna up. Long story short, we go back up to my room. You open the briefcase. Mm -hmm. I open the briefcase, and just like a thriller movie, there was a ton of what we wanted. Need I say no more? I told the guy that if he was a cop, I'd throw him out the window. <laughs> and we were on the 13th floor, no, the 14th. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around. But he was going out. So now this is maybe an hour or so before we had to come up, come go back to the gig and play. And um, needless to say, m myself and my best friend 
were a little tuned at the time. Yeah. And that was the only gig that he and I ever fucked up. But not to the audience's knowledge, but to Billy's knowledge. Okay. Billy turned around to him and I at one point during a show and just gave us this fucking look. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to kill you. Kind of had to, I and mean, it's pretty high stakes shit, and you guys are getting loaded, and oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, like, we were used to getting, <laughs> I mean, dude, I had fucking, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. Bobby and I had two risers, his drum riser and my keyboard riser. Yeah. There was a tunnel between us that between songs, or when we had a break between songs, we would meet our roadies. Text <laughs> underneath in the tunnels. I had my wine. I had my my wine tech. Had my blow tech. And Bobby's dead, so he doesn't care what I'm saying right yeah. now. We we yeah. both had the same thing. Only he 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 drank Johnny Walker Black. Yeah. So anyway, we time our little ventures and meetings in between songs. And but that, yeah yeah we never screwed up a gig even. In Texas, when we did that show, we never screwed it up, you know. Yeah. It was a good thing I was standing, able to stand, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, you uh, know, I've been called the bad boy keyboardist for rock for a long time, and most keyboard players that I remembered and still admire were these very studious looking people. Yeah, like tactical, kind of almost nerdy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nerdy's the word. Um, but I didn't want to say that. 70s Moog stuff. Yeah, but you know, I mean, no. but I'm just talking about mad scientists. Their, their, their function, <laughs> yeah, their, their function in, in, a, in a rock band was minimal. Yeah, you yeah. know. And oh, yeah, I was, yeah. I was willing to, to, to stop that. And, you know, my right. one of my favorite bands, like I said, was Zeppelin. And their keyboard treatment in a band that heavy was phenomenal to me. The other thing I was going to point out about your career is when you were playing with all those guys, uh, that was like the height of like keyboard hooks in rock. Mm -hmm. So that was like perfect for you, well, you know, like yeah. in the dark and all that. Yeah, you know, and you know what? Memorable. I'm yeah. glad you said that because one of my inspirations were uh, was the keyboard player for the Cars. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And yeah. I played with Elliot Easton before. I'd actually like to do that. We should do something with a keyboard hook. You, you know, know, yeah. It's, 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 you know. Instead of just, but, you know, in the back. Yeah, instead of pads and shit like that, fuck that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've worked with so many double guitar playing bands in my yeah. life that yeah. if you have, you're not given that much space right. as a keyboard player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if, and the space that you're given should make, make an impact. I don't care if it's one measure or two measures exactly. that you have. Exactly. And it's got to be a hook. Exactly. It's just got to be a fucking hook. Yeah. And I came up with hooks. On the Don't Say No record, and after that, way after that as well, and for everybody else's albums I've ever played on. Yeah, you know, we'll probably wrap this up in a little bit, but like, if we were going to talk about everything Alan did, we'd be here like till four in the fucking morning. So <laughs> he also did, you know, stuff with with Bon Jovi. But there's a couple ones, real quick, that maybe you could talk about, kind of because maybe they're a little bit more closer to what we do or related, or maybe just because I'm a fan of these groups more, but, uh, you know, and I'm interested in it. Hopefully you guys out there will be too. And also, by the way, guys, I'm going to link some of this stuff in the description. I'll link our new single that we did together. I'll link some of the stuff from Alan's history. So I don't have to keep saying, click this and click that. Just look in the description below. Uh, let us know what you think, you know, about this. If you want to see more you know, kind of sit down talks um, like this. If you enjoy it, leave a like, leave a comment, uh, subscribe. That's a big thing that helps us. You know, that's how the game is played nowadays. I don't make the rules, you know, but that's just, that's just how it is. It really helps us if you subscribe. But anyway, um, you you played with Iggy, you, Iggy Pop. You played with John Entwistle of The Who mm -hmm. and Leslie West. Mm -hmm. Let's just run through those a little bit. Iggy Pop, I remember asking you about it because I was really interested. And you're like, I don't even remember what album I played. <laughs> I really don't. What did you do? How do you not same, remember it? You, you did a tour back, and an album? No, just the background vocals on one of his tracks and okay. two of his tracks. Okay. Yeah. And again, that was Desmond that was produced. Okay, by, oh, Desmond you know, Child. Okay. And I don't think I played any keyboards on that. I okay. might have, but. You know, okay. 
I'm trying to remember what I ate for breakfast, man. So that was Desmond Child stuff. Yeah. That's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That was the period where he was just, I need it. I need a back. I need a keyboard. I need a vocal. Yeah. Let's call Alan. Call mm -hmm. Bobby. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I got you. And, um, and Twistle, uh, I, I checked some of that stuff out. I actually really liked it. I mean, it had a Who flavor, but it was like him coming out of his shell. You guys all did a great job. It was very keyboard centric. You got it. You got some in on that, man. And you told me about that. It seemed that you enjoyed it. You said sometimes you played even small clubs, smaller than you might think a member yeah. of the Who yeah. would be playing. But you said it was just. I mean, from what I gathered, it was a good experience. It was a great experience, man. I mean, I lived with him for almost a year at his castle. Wow. In, in England, and that's where we did the Vampires record for yep. Fox. Very cool. And I co-wrote a bunch of that with John. The thing that people don't really realize about John was that all the horn parts on the new <laughs> records were written and played by him. Okay. And that's where he and I got hit it off at one point because I grew up playing trumpet as well. Oh. So the stuff that we did on his record, he and I co-wrote all the horn sections and string sections and whatnot. But aside from that, the man's fingers were luxurious. I can't, I don't, can't, I can't find a, a better word for that. They were delicate. They were fingers that, you know, just for, watch him play, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he would spend two hours on his bass guitar sounds, which is fine by me. Wow. Yeah. Gave me a time to go to the bar and drink, you know. <laughs> but the time that I lived at his place and we were doing that, uh, the movie score for Fox, um, we did it. He had his own home studio. Uh, the engineer was Bobby Pridden, who did a lot of the, the Who engineering for a lot of years. But, you know, it would be four in the morning and John and I would be up, you know, obviously, you know, him and his Remy and me and whatever I was doing. Um, we just became very good close friends. Um, unfortunately, and I will put this to words, the person that was at that point in time managing, supposedly managing John's career yeah. was a dickhead. One of the interesting things was you wound up playing with Keith Moon, the drummer of The Who. Now, he had already passed away, uh, but they dug up some of John Entwistle's stuff. He yeah. had dug up, he had started in the 70s, yeah. and he, I guess he put it aside. He was busy with The Who or mm -hmm. Life or whatever he was doing. Dug it out, and so you got to play with Keith Moon yeah. of The Who. Last, <laughs> last record that Keith ever played on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was an honor, you know, and... Absolutely, and he's one of the, those drummers. You can tell it's him playing. You know, well, that like, was sort of similar to the relationship I have with my best friend Bobby from Squire, the yep. drummer from there. You know, and uh, that's another reason why Ed Whistle and I got along together. You know. And, okay. Uh, how about with Leslie West? You were on the solo <laughs> albums, or <laughs> he just laughs when you Leslie West. Uh, I, I kind of understand why Le he's a character. Uh, he actually just passed away recently. Yeah, he did. Um, he was, he's a New York character. Uh, mm -hmm. They called him Mountain because he was a he was a mountain, yeah. a big hefty guy. But what he is known for, if you're not familiar with Mountain, maybe you know some of you are, some of you aren't. But he was basically one of the fathers of heavy metal, really that crossover from psychedelic and acid rock mm -hmm. into metal, just because his voice was so gritty and, and, and hard and his guitar playing so loud and, 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 and riffs. I mean, he was really, that's where metal started, you know, uh, Zeppelin and Mountain, Black Sabbath. In fact, in fact, Mountain and Black Sabbath used to tour together mm -hmm. uh, back in the day. Black Sabbath opened for Mountain, and Bud would tell me they looked at Sabbath like a C-grade metal band. That's mm -hmm. what he said, and then all of a sudden, you know, as they you saw, up. yeah, through their career, they took over the world, you know. But uh, Leslie West, yeah, um, he just passed away. I got to see him a few times. Alan played, you played on a couple of his solo records? Yeah, yeah. played with him. Actually, not only that, but um, he and I, I'm sure you're familiar with Howard Stern. Yep. Um, Howard had a, a, a three or four deal um, pilot agreement for Fox. Yeah. And Leslie was... Uh, asked to do to put the, uh, the the band together for the show and be the MD for the show, but Leslie didn't read a note of music, so oh. Leslie in all his splendor calls me and he goes, "Hey, Alan," <laughs> and that's the way he talked. He goes, yep. uh, 
I need you to do this thing for me. And I said, okay, <laughs> whatever you want, dude, you know. And I had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning at the fucking studio. And I said, he goes, I don't write music. I need you to come in here and do this. <laughs> I said, so does that mean I'm the MD? He goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to so, the music business. Yeah, so, like, yeah, I, but I, I did, did it yeah. for him anyway. It was funny. And we, and we had some great musicians there. Yeah, yeah, and great guests. The show never took off, obviously. But, um, yeah, Leslie and I... Um, God bless him, man. He was a serious diabetic. Yep. You know, yeah, he lost his foot. Lost his leg. He spent his last couple of years playing guitar in a, oh, wheelchair, in a wheelchair, motorized yeah. wheelchair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? so. But um, he, he, anybody who is a guitar player should know this. All those guitar riffs that Leslie came up with and still are being played now, he played with these two fingers. That's crazy. That's the first thing you learn not to do. Don't be this guy. And like, yeah, he was just a, a character, weird kind of gritty attitude. You know, when you first get the Mountain album, I mean, you look at it, you think of these elegant hippies. Not elegant, but you know what I mean. These big kind of flowery, whimsical. How Felix Papillardi used to dress with all the ornamental stuff. But when you meet Leslie, he's just like a New York guy with a big mouth. You know what I mean? Like, um, and all, all, all power to him. But I remember Bud told me a lot of stories about him. And I met met uh, Leslie West once at the Nam mm -hmm. show. And Bud was, I told Bud I was going. He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, just mention my name. You know, he'll you'll be treated like royalty. You know, he'll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, so I, I got to Leslie. Like that I, I, I like, Oh yeah, I'm working with Bud Prager, and he just looks at me like. Well, don't listen to him or something. <laughs> no, Leslie was was nothing less than honest. Trust me. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. it's just a, he was just a character, man, and and, and made an implant uh, impact on, on rock history, man. Yeah, it's, yeah, he made an implant too. <laughs> he could have used one. Story. Growing up with and playing with some of these people that I listened to as a kid was like amazing to me. You know, the Alice's, the Nugent's, the, the Who, absolutely. You know, it's like, come on, man. It's like, I, I don't know what I did to deserve that. But I did, you know. That's I, what it, why, you know, it was just mind-blowing to me, jamming with you. I'm like, you hear this, and I, I, you're very humble about it, man. You're very cool about it. I'm, we got to talk about this, man. This is absolutely Dude, nuts, Humility man. is the key. <laughs> humility yeah. is the key. Yeah, you know, spirituality to me and humility to me is the key, and always will be, right. always has been, and I know it is for you too. True, you know it's you were given a, a gift from wherever, call it the universe, call it to God, call it whatever you want. Don't fuck it up. Yep, simple, yep. you know. Yeah, and I've never fucked it up. You know, and I've, I, that's one of the things yep. I'm proud of, and yep. that's one of the things that people have to remember. If if you want this career, man, just Go for it. You know, don't get hung up in all the bullshit. Just to write, write, write. That's it. It's as simple as that. And, and then you'll find a way. If you feel strong enough about the material that you've written, <coughs> you'll find a way to get it out there. I'm a Luddite from way back. I won't lie to you. And you got to think about what, you know, your idea of success is. Like, for example, for me... I respect a band if they have one good song. Mm -hmm. One fucking good song, guys. I, like, you guys look at bands like they only have one good song, they suck. No. I'll, most musicians or a lot of musicians, they have no good songs, mm -hmm. you know? And so when I see one good song, I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. respect to you, you know? And so I, you know, um, that's how I look at success when the stuff we do, we want to drive it as hard as we can. We want to get it as, out to as many people as possible. But as long as it passes my standard, like the new single we've done, I'm very happy with the sound. It's the sound I've always wanted to do. It's the vibe I've always wanted to create. We did that. I'm proud of it. I can always be proud of that moment. And to me, that's a success. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean, um, you know, it doesn't mean you stop there. It doesn't mean you don't push it as hard as you can, but you've got to, you know, get something that um, satisfies yourself and, and, and inspires you to continue that drive. Listen to this fucking band, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, because otherwise I won't talk to you people anymore. <laughs> okay? Listen to this fucking guy, the keyboard wizard, I call him. Anyway, man, it's it's. Uh, I'm so glad we got to do this. This was so much fun. It's so fucking badass. And we're gonna do a lot more together. You know, I hope uh, we got, we're gonna do some new songs together, some new recordings, 
an album, and we should be playing live. We're going to be playing live around uh, California, L.A., and uh, Las Vegas in August. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. And again, thanks for joining us. And check down in the description. I put the links to uh, all of this guy's stuff. All the stuff we just talked about should be down there. Subscribe and catch you next time. You're in the grave, but you